Hello and welcome to Premier Scene. I'm Nicola Johnston and we are here to talk to the director and the cast of Dark Tourist. Hey, when are you leaving? In the morning. Now, one of these years I'm going to go with you. Uh, my trip's on my own, you know that. When you're dealing with a psychological thriller, how important is it for you to find the darks and the lights within that story? That's a great question. Um, I think it's incredibly important, but at the same time, I think you've got to be very careful when you're telling a dark thriller to not, what I would call, say, cop out in, in this sense. I think a lot of dark thrillers tend to sort of create those lighter moments um, in order to sort of relieve the tension somehow, in order to then, when the bigger, darker moments come, for them to be more explosive. What we chose to do in, in Dark Tourists is not to do that. That once we've got you by the throat, as it were, we don't really let you go. In other words, we we felt it was very important. This is a serious psychological horror story, and it we thought it was really important that we don't let you off the hook, so that you are aware of the whole gr gruesome, cruel reality of what is inside this guy's mind. Because it is about a state of mind, isn't it? And the loneliness that some people burden inside of them, and also I think pain. And it seemed to be that the characters are, they are in a lot of pain and they're almost looking for something to help them bring them out of that. Would you agree with that? I think that's another great question. I re no, it really is a great question because it is about pain. There's a wonderful scene in the film, I think, between Michael Cudlitz and Melanie Griffith when in voiceover, he's lied to her in the scene. He's told her something that is not true. But he says in voiceover, he says, so what? He says, she has pain, I have pain. And that's how we've connected and that really is what it's about it's about people who have been connecting and then of course how that connection can be a destructive one and a, and, a, and a dark and sinister one at the end of it it's about a man's search for intimacy who never had intimacy uh, it's about a man who was brutalized in childhood whose parents were, were unable or unwilling or incapable of caring for him and looking after his pain it's about a society who equally, you know, failed and neglected in their duty. Yeah, let them down. Would you say then, I mean, I know every film that's made has something to say to its audiences, but with your film, there seems to be quite a strong social statement. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I do, completely. I mean, we call it Dark Tourist. It's also been known by another title, The Grief Tourist, but Dark Tourist is its title. We call it that because we want people to be aware that what we're doing is we're putting a mirror, in a way, up to... I guess a sensationalist sort of uh, uh, desire that we have as a society, reflected in the media, of course, which is, you know, to really become too fascinated and too interested and too indulgent in the monsters that society may inadvertently create, and not enough time, and not, not enough interest, and not enough, you know, frankly, money spent on the victims. Of those well, things. They almost so, become like celebrity, don't they? Completely, yeah, completely. And I mean, I'm, you know, I'm the last person to ever be a grief tourist, and that's why I wanted to make the film because um, I get very, very unsettled by sensationalist news reporting. You know, you can you can name any tragedy or disaster that's happened over the last few months or years. Most recently, let's take for example the Spanish train crash. I remember watching the news coming in about this, and I could see the disappointment in journalists' faces when they realised that the numbers were not going up anymore. And the excitement in the tone of their voices when they realised that the Sales. number one had died. Money, yeah. And my last question, because we're pushed for time, yeah. is really in terms of your fantastic cast. Because to see an actress like Melanie in a role like this, mm -hmm. it just, well, it gives actresses hope. Because there you have a wonderful script with brilliant actors and you can't really go wrong. Did you build trust easily with the actors on this film? You know, you never, I always, great, a great believer as a director that you don't assume uh, respect or trust from your cast. Uh, you have to earn it and, um, and you either do or you don't. Um, I think it's very important in a film like this, particularly that's dealing with very, very complex emotions and, you know, requires an enormous amount emotionally from the actors that they feel secure. They're able to, if, if, if you like, you know, I often describe it as you walk to the edge of a cliff with an actor and you, you know, you hold their hand and you ask them to close their eyes and they have to trust you, they're on the edge. And you have to somehow get your actors um, to you know, trust you to, to that extent. How that process happens, I don't really know, except a it's belief in the truth. Process, it's an organic, it? it's an organic, organic process, and as long as you're, 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 you're well-meaning, your intentions are correct and you're clear and they're, 
and they are serious. And I think with a film like this, of course, I think one of the important things for all of us was, and particularly for Melanie Griffith and Mike Cudlitz, is that we have to be making the same movie. Um, and we have to know that that movie is a serious movie. Um, about serious issues and not a gratuitous slasher, you know, uh, shallow film about, you know, just exciting or, 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 or scaring people, but that the horror in it, the fears in it, are earned. I've come from a genuine place. Carl Meisler. This guy was a uh, mass murder arsonist. Oh, great. You get a lot of people coming through here going to the places where he killed people. What kind of sick thrill did they get by doing that, you know? I don't know about those things. I was speaking to Suri yes. a couple of minutes ago, so I already know that you were producing this movie as well. Yes. But I believe that it all began with a group of your friends yes. who had some money yep. and yep. Um, wanted to make a you film. About that. Yes. Yeah. And it was um, written for you as well? It was, yes. What, what happened was um, uh, two of my friends approached me and said that they, they have some funding to make a film and they wanted to make a film with me as the lead. What did I want to do? I said, I don't have anything. They said, okay, we're going to look for scripts, but if you have anything, you know, let us know. So I went to another friend of mine, uh, Frank John Hughes, who I did Band of Brothers with, and I, he's a very prolif prolific writer. And I said, do you have anything within the sort of the parameters of this budget, this amount of money? He says, I, I only have one project. He says, and I'm not selling it. And I said, well, why aren't you selling it? He says, because I wrote it for you. I said, well, they want to do it with me. And he's like, oh. Well, that changes everything. So three months later, we were in pre-production. Okay. Very, I very just quick development. Take you back to when your friend handed you that script, then, and you went away and you read it. Mm -hmm. What happened when you read it? Because I, I believe the writing was incredible. Amazing. Yeah. I, I, well, at first, I just like I, I put it down on my on my chest and then I went and looked over to my wife. I said, "Oh my God." She said, "Why?" I go, "This is this is freaking amazing." <laughs> yeah. She said, well, "Let me read it." I said, "Here." So I gave it to her. Um, and then I sort of waited until she was done. I was, you know, doing other things on my phone or iPad or something. And, and then she put it down and she said, oh, you have to do this. You know, actually, I think what I said to her is I go, please tell me I'm not crazy. Because I think I'm crazy. Because I, I, I think this is amazing. And it's, and it's dark and it's got a lot of really twisted elements in it. But I'm, I'm really, really pulled into this. I said, T tell me, like, am I just, just read it. And then she read it and she said, no, you're not. It's, it's fantastic. You have to do it. And I guess when you start working on a background for your character, mm -hmm. it's all about finding the honesty and the truth. Absolutely. And the human aspect. Abs absolutely. Because Otherwise, it doesn't work. you can't work. just play the darkness. Yeah. No, no, no. Well, and the darkness is not... I, I mean, not giving anything away. Yeah. He, he's not... Evil people don't think they're evil. No, of course. You know, they think they're, they've got it all figured out. You know, it's like, it, this is the plan according to Jim Tana. You know, he, he's very much, uh, um, very much convinced that he has everything under control, completely under control, um, down to the rolled socks. I mean, he's, he's got it totally dialed in. So for you, is it about keeping all those things kind of simmering mm -hmm. underneath the lids? The loneliness and the pain and the hurt and the frustrations and I guess the sense of needing to belong to something? Yeah. Yeah, and it's then no one's help there to help. No, no, and that's and that's another thing. Like if you really take the, the film in sort of an abstract way and look at it, it's a it's a commentary on the mental health situation in the world right now. You know, people who, who what would happen if these people got help when they needed it? Yeah. You know. so it would be a different world. So yeah, that's and it would be it, the film would be in a different world. festival. <laughs> And when you were working with Suri and Melanie, some of the scenes, very intimate scenes, mm -hmm. a lot of eye contact, mm -hmm. were you allowed to improvise or were you given rehearsal time or did you just go for it? Was, it was rehearsal time. First of all, let me just say I didn't really care for Suri at all. I don't really like him. I don't um, you. One bit. Um, <laughs> at all. No, Suri was fantastic. Um, and Melanie was fantastic, you know, coming in. You know, we, we had no money. You know, so she did this because of the script as well. Just yeah. Good no, that's so that's. Bad out there. Uh, there can be, yes, yeah. there absolutely can be, and and when something is that good, it it, it really jumps out at you. Um, but the process with Surrey was, um, you know, we would go through things, and, and if things didn't work, Frank was always on set, and we would we would tweak things if they didn't work, or if they didn't if we didn't feel they were working, he, we would 
he would come in and explain what his intention was and maybe clarify what was going on, if, the, if there was any sort of ambiguity to it or, or confusion as to what the moment was about. Um, but that, that's the beauty of independent film, though, as well, because you have that creative control. Exactly. And it is more like a family. Yeah, and you exactly. you really care about yep. this, yeah. this film. No, and then you had four guys on set who, who and five, when Surrey came on, who were in full agreement you know, as to what the story was, how it was going to be told, you know, and the tone. So, it, you know, nothing was sort of like... Well, we can't, you know, we can't go in that direction because we, you know, we may not get distribution, or you know, that's, you know, too too much of this or too much of that. It's like, no, stick to the, we'll, we'll deal with all that later. Stick to the script, you know, and we all were right, right there. So.